In the UK, over 5 million people have to visit the emergency department every year. But some cases are more complicated than others. In Liverpool, nine-year-old Claudia has come into accident and emergency looking... I think the technical term is fed up. So what's wrong, Claudia? Every time I eat... Um, yes? After, like, 15 minutes, after, um, my tummy starts going funny. It's been, been so there. So when did the pain start? After my lunch today, um, I started feeling the pain in my tummy. Hmm. Let's stop you there and get the full story. For the last few days, whenever Claudia eats, she ends up with tummy pain. She'll happily tuck into something... Like a burger and chips? Yes. And the food happily makes its way down to her stomach. That's the weird contraption, then. Right. But even though she's enjoyed it... See, she looks happy. Fifteen minutes later, sharp pains erupt in her tummy. Ouch! And I couldn't walk last night because it was um, so and painful. Meet Dr. Sarah Piper and let's get solving this mystery. Time to examine the evidence. Can you show me where your tummy saw? Yeah. Over there. Dr. Sarah tests for tummy tenderness because Claudia's family have a history of stomach problems. That could be a clue. It's probably a bit of a viral infection. I think a virus is definitely a suspect, don't you? Yes, but we may need to rule out a few other things first. She's pointing more to the liver area, which is where your gallbladder is, um, which, and especially saying after meals, makes you think, is it something to do with the gallbladder? So the gallbladder is a potential suspect too. Mmm, it's possible. This is the gallbladder, a small organ next to our stomach that helps digest the fat in our food. Sometimes, if there's too much fat in the gallbladder, pebble-like deposits called gallstones can build up, causing pain after eating. And this is what Claudia may have. My concern is, is this a gallbladder problem, which is a very, very rare problem in children, but she's got a family history, so we're just doing some tests to make sure. Yes, we need to get to the bottom of this. Claudia's having some blood tests. So it's just a little pinprick. And she'll be going for a special scan that will hopefully let us get this mystery solved. We'll be back later to see if we can get to the bottom of Claudia's tummy troubles. Ouch. Hospital doctors and nurses always expect the unexpected. Let's see how they fix our first patient. In Manchester, the emergency department have a new admission. 13-year-old Reese, who's come in with a badly battered face. I damaged my forehead and my nose and my lip there. You can say that again. I'm amazed you can even speak. It's hard to smile because my, my lips like falling and I can't move it up. I'd just keep a straight face, Reese. So how on earth did you end up like that? Well, what happened was, lovely balloons, Reese was celebrating his cousin's birthday party at the local bike park. He was on a half pipe doing his thing. The crowd were loving it, so he set off for the big one. Uh, that's a steep slope. Nice big stadium, too. No pressure, Reese. He set off, but the slope was so steep, and Reese tried to stop. He pulled on his brake, but he did it too hard, and the next thing he knew, he flew over the handlebars. Oh dear, no more bike. Yep, he went flying through the air until he landed smack on his face. Ouch! Luckily, Reese was wearing a helmet. And his injuries aren't as bad as they look, but it's still pretty uncomfortable. I find it very hard to eat and everything because my tongue goes swollen. Well, there's definitely no chance of getting your mouth around a burger right now, that's for sure. Reese was treated just after the accident, but now he's back in hospital to get his wounds checked out and find out if he'll need any more treatment. And the man doing the finding out is Professor Kevin Macway Jones. Well, we need to take the dressings down, have a really good look at his wounds and make sure they're not infected. Then we need to decide exactly what dressings need to be put on there and whether there's any surgery that needs to be done immediately or whether that can wait for later, if it's needed at all. First things first, Nurse Michael needs to get those dressings off. I'm going to take the dressings off and see what everything looks like underneath. Is that OK? Although it looks nasty, swelling is part of the body's healing process. When you're injured, chemicals are released which cause our blood vessels to widen. This allows more blood and infection-fighting cells to get to the injured area, but some of them leak into the surrounding tissue, causing the whole area to swell up. 
just like Reese's lip. So with the dressing off, how's it looking? The one at the top is healing well. Yeah, the one over your nose is healing well. The one up above your lip, OK, that's a little bit deeper. So I think what we need to do is redress it. We'll bring you back to clinic so that we can see how it's doing and we'll make a decision when you come back to clinic next time. Although his nose and forehead can be left dressing free, Reese's lip still needs to be covered. And he'll have to come back in two weeks' time when the swelling's gone down to see if surgery is necessary. I just can't wait to get back to normal because I need to get back eating again. Fingers crossed some decent food will be on the card soon, mate. We'll be back to find out what happens with Reese's lip later on. Your body can need mending in all sorts of ways, and we're going to meet some special teams that are trained to fix you. <laughs> Speaking is one of the most complicated things you can do. And while I bet you know that your lips and tongue and voice box are all involved, I bet you don't know what your soft palate does, or even where it is. Well, open your mouth and say ah. Uh... See that? It's where the dangly bit hangs from. And most of us use it without even thinking about it. But today, we're going to meet a patient who's learning to use hers. Nine-year-old Millie is in speech therapy after she was born with a cleft palate. This means she had a hole going through the roof of her mouth to her nose. She's had a series of operations to fix this. However, Millie still finds speaking a little bit difficult. There are some sounds that you find really easy and some sounds that you find difficult. And I find the S. Word more difficult than other words. And that's, that's the one you've been working on today, isn't it? Yeah. When you make a speech sound like an S, the soft palate needs to lift up and make a seal with the back of the throat. In Millie's case, she isn't able to do that. So when air comes up, it isn't directed just into her mouth, it also escapes down her nose as well. To help her with that, she's working with speech therapist Jane O'Connell. Today I've joined the class and Jane's set us a challenge. I've got to make up a sentence for each of these words. Tell and me. then I'll be better than you. Yeah. <laughs> and I use powerful adjectives as well. Oh, you might use powerful adjectives? Yeah. I don't think I know any powerful adjectives. <laughs> so. My dad showed um, the word to make a door. My dad sawed the word to make a door. Good sentence. Now it's my turn. Uh, I saw the sun shining in the sky. No, what I saw. What you saw is... Millie's having none of it. So I can't say I saw the sun? No. No, I meant like I saw the sun. No, that doesn't work, does it? <laughs> well, you tried. I think I need my homework more than Millie. <laughs> <laughs> there are other sounds that most of us take for granted, but again, our bodies have to do more than you'd think. Make a mmm sound for me. Mmm. OK, what happens if I hold your nose? Listen to what happens to mm. that sound. Mm. Oh, I can't. I can't do it. No. What would normally happen is the air would come down your nose, but because I'm holding your nose, I'm blocking the air from coming down. And it actually turns that sound into almost a b sound. So try that at home. Make a mmm sound. And the mmm sound is a nasal sound where the air does have to come out your nose. And if you block your nose, mm. Mm. you can't make the sound, so it becomes a b as the air escapes. So the really difficult thing that Millie's having to learn is to consciously control muscles that most people don't even know exist, like the muscles at the top and the back of your mouth. And so that is quite a skill to master. Before we finish, Millie's got her own speaking challenge for me. OK, so I've got to say red lorry and yellow lorry. That's fast. Fast. <laughs> red lorry, yellow lorry. Red Roy Leather Lorry. Red. Oh, I can't do it. <laughs> oh, she beat me again. Good luck, Millie. <laughs> All over the UK, there are emergency teams standing by ready to help you. And they need to get to the scene of an accident fast. We're on call with the UK Emergency Services, showing you what it's really like on the front line saving lives. This is a rapid response vehicle. It's on standby 24-7 to respond to whatever emergency calls come in. Today, I'm going along for the ride, and you're coming with me. On call with me is paramedic Jan Van. She can do 20 emergency call-outs in a day. 
and a new case is just in. We're going to see someone who's got a very severe cut on the head and they're refusing to go to hospital. Now, the reason we don't have the sirens on or the blue lights on is because they're with an ambulance crew at the moment. But Jan is the only person on call at the moment who can glue his head together, which is what we're going to try and do. At the house, the man, Paul, is in good spirits despite the nasty gash to his head. Thanks for coming out. It's a short night. It's all right. As a paramedic with 10 years' experience, Jan has the expert training needed to use special glue to join Paul's wound together. Right, this glue might sting a little bit, OK? How's that feel, Paul? Can't feel anything. Not stinging. Good. The super glue that Jan's using now will hold that wound closed. It doesn't need stitches and it stops the bleeding. It'll stop infection getting in and it gives a, it gives a nice result. It gives a tidy scar. All large head wounds should be seen at a hospital, but Paul has refused to go, so Jan gives him some advice. Any headaches that aren't controlled with painkillers will need to be assessed at the hospital. Okay. Vomiting more than twice will need to be assessed at the hospital. We have got a slight issue. Well, My fingers are stuck to your head. <laughs> uh, not really. <laughs> Jan has done all she can for Paul, and it's up to him now to be vigilant and spot any side effects. See you then. Take care, see you later. Bye. Bye. See ya. So even though Paul didn't want to go to hospital, we were still able to glue his head together. That stopped the bleeding, it reduces pain, it reduces the chances of infection, and we've given him some really clear advice about what to do if he gets worse and he does need to go to hospital. And that's all thanks to Jan. With hundreds of rapid response crews in the UK, if you have an accident, an emergency service like this won't be far away. Hospital doctors and nurses always expect the unexpected. Let's see how they fix our first patient. In accident and emergency is 15-year-old Sam, a budding boxer suffering with sharp pains in his stomach. I've had this pain for quite a few weeks, a stabby, fiery pain. That must have been quite a fight. Who delivered the killer punch? Amir Khan? No, it didn't happen in a fight. It happened in his sleep. Right. It was night time and Sam was in bed. He was fast asleep, dreaming of boxing. That's why he's punching, then. Yes, but inside his stomach, another battle was brewing. I can see what's coming. In the red corner, we have the cramps. They look tough. And in the blue corner, it's the stabbing pains. Nice goatee. This could be a close fight. It was, and it was making Sam pretty uncomfortable. He doesn't look too good. The longer the fight went on, the worse the pain got, until it was too much and he woke up. Ouch! Off to hospital for Sam. Uh, I don't want it to get in the way uh, of my next fight. Your next fight might have to wait, Sam. First, you've got to overcome the battle in your belly. Meet Dr. Eni Folarami. He'll check our patient out. Does it hurt hair? Or does it hurt hair? So that's this is one, and this is two. Two? Two, OK. Number two. Remember that bit of a clue. To find out what's going on, Dr. Enny sends Sam for an X-ray. And after a quick snapshot, the results are in. Looking at it, he's got lots of faeces poo in his colon. Poo? And in his rectum. Yet all these areas are full of poo. Sam is severely constipated, so he really needs to go to the loo. You're really bunged up. And he doesn't mean your nose. You've got poo all over your colon. Your discomfort might become from the fact that you're constipated. I can't believe it's poo. <laughs> you better believe it, Mum. In fact, constipation is one of the most common causes of a sore stomach. To get rid of the pain, we need to get rid of that poo. Time for the world champion of poo-fighting medicine, the enema. An enema flushes fluid into Sam's large intestine to soften up the blockage and help Sam have a heavyweight poo. Let's hope this gets things moving. Well, after a night in hospital, have we had any success? He managed to go to the toilet, but the pain in his tummy is still very severe. I've been up most of the night. That stabbing and fiery pain came back. It looks like there'll be more treatment on the cards, so we'll be back for round two of Sam versus the Pooh later on.